Welcome to the Joint Legislative Oversight and Sunset Committee meeting. My name is Senator Kyle Evans Gay, and I am the chair of this committee for this year. And I'd like to ask, as we do always, um, to have our committee members introduce themselves. I will start um, with my screen. Senator Hansen is the first one listed. Good morning, everyone. Stephanie Hansen, State Senator for the 10th District, which is part of Middletown, Bear Glasgow, and a little bit of Newark. Thank you, Senator. Representative Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kendra Johnson, State Representative for the 5th District, a little bit of a few things, a little bit of Newark, a little bit of Bear, a little bit of Newcastle. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Yerrick. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Lyndon Yerrick, State Representative in the 34th District, which uh, encompasses most of uh, Camden, Wyoming, Magnolia, and Woodside. Thank you, Representative. Representative Spiegelman. Representative Jeff Spiegelman, 11th District, representing a whole lot of the southwest corner of Newcastle County and a whole lot more of the northwestern corner of Kent. Thank you, Representative. Senator Pinkney. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marie, Senator Marie Pinkney, representing the 13th District. Like Representative Johnson, a whole lot of a few things, those same three cities, but none of those same, none of, not all of those same areas, Newark, Newcastle, and Bear. We do overlap a little bit, though. Thank you, Senator. And Representative Griffith. Good morning, Krista Griffith, representing the 12th District. Thank you so much, Representative. I would like um, also our staff to please introduce yourselves, uh, starting with uh, Mark Brainerd. Thank you. My name is Mark Brainerd. I am one of two uh, analysts for the Joint Legislative Oversight and Sunset Committee. Good morning, everyone. I am Amanda McAtee, and I am the other analyst for the committee. Good morning. I'm Holly Von Wagner, and I'm legislative attorney for the committee. I'm the administrative support staff for the committee. Thank you all very much. It's great to see you uh, on this rainy morning. We seem to always pick rainy mornings to have these meetings. So um, thank you for being here. I'd like to just move on. Um, the first thing on our agenda today is to simply review the minutes from our last meeting on March 25th, 2021. They're going to be up on the screen and we're also circulated to committee members. If there's no questions or comments on the meeting minutes, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. I assume Senator Pinkney wants to approve them, so I'm going to add that on there. That one. <laughs> so that we approve the minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Pinkney. Is there a second? Second. Stephanie Hansen. Thank you, Senator Hansen. All those in favor, please signify by your silence. If you oppose, please unmute and say nay. Hearing no opposition, the minutes are approved. Thank you everyone very much. Um, before we move into our, our primary agenda item today, we just wanted to give a quick update to the committee. The Senate Sunset Committee met yesterday to consider several bills um, that were approved by this um, committee. Um, and those bills will be released from the Senate Sunset Committee, um, will be uh, hopefully heard quickly in front of the Senate as we return from the Easter break later in April. Um, so thank you everyone for your work on those bills and for attending the meeting yesterday of those on the Senate side. Um, our primary agenda item today is the DNHR QAC recommendations. Um, we're gonna look at the draft recommendation, recommendations that were prepared by our analysts for the Delaware Nursing Home Residence Quality Assurance Commission. Our staff will offer an overview of the draft recommendations um, and the staff from DNHR QAC are available should any members have any questions. So a reminder to anyone in the public watching, while there is no specific time for a public comment today, um, the public can submit any written comments to sunset at Delaware gov. And I was about to say if there's no questions, but I see one question. So Representative Spiegelman, what can we do for you? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Amanda or Mark, could you please send the email with the recommendations just so it's fresh in my email box, please? Sure. Thank you, Representative. And thank you, Mark and Amanda. I appreciate the help there. I am ready to go ahead and turn it over to Mark to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, one moment, I'll share my screen. Perfect. Okay. So this morning is the recommendation meeting for the Delaware Nursing Home Resident Quality Assurance Commission. Uh, recommendations one and two are the committee's standard continue uh, terminate and technical corrections recommendations. Uh, 
Um, not really a whole lot of explanation here. Just wanted to make sure that um, everybody sees them for the purpose of this meeting. Recommendation three focuses on the administrative and budgetary responsibility for DNHR QAC. Currently, DNHR QAC is considered an administrative office of the courts as adopted in the annual budget bill. By statute, however, uh, DNHR QAC is housed within the executive branch, specifically uh, Chapter 79 of Title 29, the Department of Health and Social Services, with membership determined by position, uh, the AG, Class E, Healthcare Association, et cetera, or appointment made by the governor or the General Assembly. Um, there is no court uh, or judicial membership uh, appointment to the commission. Other entities such as the Board of Charitable Gaming in 2013, the Health Resources Board in 2012, and the Cash Management Policy Board in 2014 were relocated administratively as a result of the JLOSC review process. Because this recommendation does not move DNHR QAC's statute, it, is, uh, it would probably be most comparable to the Council on Correction where JLOSC recommended just last year that administrative and budgetary responsibility would be that of the Criminal Justice Council, but they would remain in statute within the Department of Correction. Option one would place administrative and budgetary responsibility within the Department of Safety and Homeland Security. The department is uh, currently home to the Delaware Disability Council and the State Council for Persons with Disabilities. As a point of clarification, the state's council, the state council's governing statute exists within the department's chapter of code. The Delaware Disability Council does not appear in code, but was placed within the department by epilogue language in the FY07 budget. Option two would place the administrative and budgetary responsibility within the Department of Health and Social Services. Given several options of placement within DHSS, uh, should the committee adopt this option, um, your staff will work with DHSS and DNHR QAC to come up with a more specific uh, path forward for that. Recommendation. Mark, can I ask a quick clarifying question on recommendation three? Um, I know you note here that the governing statute is within DHSS um, with this option. Does, does this option mean that the, the governing you know, pieces of the code would be moved or is, are you just at this piece rec recommending a administrative structural move? Just, just the, it, it would stay right where it is in the code. It's not moving it anywhere else. It's just kind of staying right, right where it is in the executive branch. Thank you. Recommendation four explores a name, a name change for DNHR QAC. In our research, staff found two studies looking at the use of acronyms and initialisms, particularly as they relate to clarity, knowledge, and the ability to recall conveyed information. The first is from researchers Christina Izura and David Playfoot. They looked at the correlation between pronunciation patterns, amount of letters, error rate, and recall time. One conclusion they reached pertained to the number of letters, particularly in, acronym, in acronyms where each letter is said as a letter. More, uh, the more letters correlated to higher error rates and the ability to recall. The second study listed here from the Association for Psychological Science looked at, the, looked at acronyms in writings, um, not necessarily in speech, but in a in written documents. And the correlation with the complexity of an abbreviation and the intended audience's response um, of interest, frustration, difficulty in recalling information. They concluded uh, higher complexities without continuous clarifications uh, was tied to an increase in audience, in audience disinterest and frustration. Um, I did provide a, an example here only, this is only as an example to show the pronunciation pattern and length that this research showed limited error rates. It limited audience disinterest, frustration, and recall difficulty. Recommendation five asks uh, DNHR QAC to develop a criteria for visits to long-term care facilities. 
Currently, the annual report provides the number of visits and the overall general purpose of them. The intent of this recommendation is to provide stakeholders additional insight and details of these visits, particularly as they specifically relate to DNHRQAC's examination and evaluation of the long-term care quality assurance system in the state and any recommended changes to that system. Recommendation six's intent is for DNHRQAC to utilize the expertise of the commission and continue to advocate for changes to nursing home staffing ratios or Eagle's law as it's called. Similarly to number six, recommendation seven asks DNHRQAC to do the same type of advocacy while reviewing and evaluating the long-term care quality assurance system. These three, recommendations as an umbrella focused on increased advocacy and evaluation of Delaware's current quality assurance system and are based on the issues discussed by DNHRQAC during this review process. With DNHRQAC's charge to examine policies, evaluate effectiveness, analyze trends, and make recommendations, recommendations five, six, and seven are a potential avenue to further meet those obligations. In the questionnaire to the committee, uh, DNHRQAC listed the development of a legislative elder caucus as an opportunity for improvement. Recommendation eight asks DNHRQAC to provide the General Assembly specific information on its possible creation. For example, does DNHRQAC recommend a standing legislative committee like Connecticut, Minnesota, and California have, or is it more of an informal working group like Colorado and Maine and Delaware's own uh, Kids Caucus and Small Business Caucus? Recommendation nine makes changes to DNHRQAC's annual report. To reiterate a little bit of what I said before, the intention behind this recommendation is to enhance and highlight the advocacy efforts of DNHRQAC, um, bring the annual report more in line with the duties outlined in statute of evaluating effectiveness of the current quality assurance commission, as well as review and make recommendations to um, stakeholders to improve it. And then lastly, recommendations 10 are, are, and 11 are the standard reporting requirement recommendations and release and holdover recommendations. So I know I threw a lot, <laughs> a lot at you um, very, very quickly. So um, I, please, I, any questions you have, I, I will uh, scroll back um, through if, if anybody needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And, and I know that um, I appreciate Amanda sending to the entire um, committee the the materials again so that you know they're right in front of us. I want to make sure too that everyone has had a chance to um, look at um, the the commission's responses to the draft. There was a, I think helpful dialogue between the analysts and the commission, um, which which helped me understand um, kind of how to move forward in in a good way. So I'm going to move first to questions and comments from the committee, starting with uh, Representative Griffith. Good morning, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Mark, for an exceptional uh, report, as always. Um, first off, I just totally agree with the, the the acronym for the organization has always been in trouble, you know, in terms of really clearly identifying what it is and what its purpose is. So, I mean, I think that's a good starting point. If you can't even really say the organization um, succinctly, you know, you're, you're gonna have trouble figuring out what it does. So I think that's a great starting point. With recommendation number eight, I'm intrigued by the idea of an elder law caucus. I do want to say this, though. Sometimes we create extra layers, and I don't, and, and I'm worried that it's not that I, I, I love that idea. You know, I professionally, I, I worked for years as um, the head of the Senior Protection Initiative of the Delaware Department of Justice. And so, but, but what I caution us on that is that already, I believe we have legislators that serve on this board. We have legislators that work in other areas of, um, you know, of senior uh, citizen issues and on various commissions. And so I fear that by creating yet another caucus, what we're doing is sort of just adding yet another meeting without 
a focus. And so my, my thought on that would be, let's create elder law caucuses around specific issues, not just a general one. Because I, I've seen in my in history, you know, in my, my work history that when you do that, it sort of doesn't, it loses its effectiveness. And, you know, I, I, I find it much more helpful and much more appealing when we have a, a, a laser focused topic that we need to address. Um, and then we're focused on that, be it, you know, reducing staffing ratios for those assisted living facilities. You know, I know that that's a very, that's a, a very hot topic right now and that the the ratios for assisted living folks and memory care units are different than those that are in nursing homes. You know, so so looking at, at kind of a, an issue focused topic, I think uh, that would be my position on uh, you know quote unquote caucus because it's it's you know it's it's nice to be able to resolve an issue and and then we can lean on those legislators that are hopefully involved directly with organizations like this one as board members. Um, in terms of the um, meeting schedules, did you have any recommend? Did you find any issues with quorum or folks attending meetings or keeping um, keeping the committee together? Like, are there a lot of vacancies often? Or if you could update me a little bit about the consistency of the board, and is it true that this recommendation would so that who who the director reports to would be that board? Is that correct? Who 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 oversees the work of the director? Correct. The, um, based on the governing statute, the uh, director is um, hired by the commission members. Um, so they, they, uh, they have the hiring ability. They, they, <laughs> the term used in the statute is furnish staff, that the commission has the power to furnish staff um, based on the allocation made by the General Assembly. Um, I believe it was the last General Assembly, and I'm trying to, yes, in the 150th General uh, Assembly, House Bill 62 was passed, which um, dealt with a lot of the issues surrounding quorum and vacancies. They, the DNHRQAC was having those types of issues. And since the passage of this bill, um, it has gotten a lot better for them. I will defer to the chair and the, Executive director, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but um, based on my conversations with them, that House Bill 62 went a long way in addressing those issues uh, during the last uh, GA. Representative Griffith, uh, how about we bring our guests up to, to comment on that, if that works for you? That's perfect. And then after that, I don't, I, I'm finished with my question. So um, thank you. I just am interested to hear what they, how they feel the, the statute passed in the last session has positively or ne negatively impacted them. Um, and then I'm finished. Thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Representative. Um, Ms. Ferber, Ms. Bailey, if you would just both introduce yourselves and uh, if you can address Representative Griffith's question, that'd be much appreciated. Sure. Hi, I'm Margaret Bailey. I'm Executive Director of the Delaware Nursing Home Residence Quality Assurance Commission. Lisa, do you wanna introduce yourself? Good morning. Um, I'm Lisa Ferber. I am the current chair of the Delaware Nursing Home Residence Quality Assurance Commission. Um, and the answer to your question about the uh, um, House Bill 62, um, yes, we, we made a few changes which have um, um, helped tremendously in the um, um, ability to have a quorum. Uh, there were a lot of positions before that were governor appointed. Um, and there was political party involved and we had that removed um, from the piece of legislation and, and it, it's helped a lot. Lisa, do you have anything you wanna add? No, I agree completely that um, that legislative change made a world of difference in our ability to get members appointed and um, have quorum. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, your service on the board um, and, and with the organization. And, and thank you for being here today to help us um, understand better uh, how we can work uh, with you all on these recommendations. Um, I don't see any hands, so I will just, uh, <laughs> thanks Representative Bjerg. Um, I'm not gonna, don't worry, I'm not moving on too fast. I just wanted to say, I'll, I'll take a moment to comment. I, I really did have the same reaction around the Elder Caucus that Representative Griffith had. Um, and I do think though, um, that there is, I, I think I understand 
where it's coming from in the sense that this, the, this organization, this commission is intended to be an advocacy organization. Um, and I know you take that very seriously. And I think that what um, the report and what the recommendations show is that this organization could move even further into the legislative side of advocacy as much as the, as the personal advocacy so that we, we pair those two functions, what, we're, what you all are seeing in practice and what we need to do as a, a, as a general assembly to ensure the safety um, of these individuals you know, who are in care. So um, outside of an, an elder caucus, I, I would be curious what members of the committee think as far as we've asked organizations to provide strategic plans around different aspects. We've asked them um, to provide you know, reports around different aspects. And perhaps instead of creating something, we, we may be able to keep a piece of this and, and ask this organization to provide us um, a very targeted update or a plan regarding the growth of legislative advocacy um, for the organization. Um, so I, 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 don't, I would love to have that opportunity to discuss it if folks um, have thoughts about that. Um, and while everyone's thinking, I'm happy to move on to Representative Yerkes. Um, comments too, and we can kind of come back to the draft recommendations as we move through them. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I would echo what um, the Senator initially commented about the uh, recommendations and the work on behalf of Ma Mark and everybody. Uh, as looking at what the recommendations are and where there's alignment in regard to, um, you know, what the, uh, the board, the commission's advocating in an agreement of, we get, we get down to recommendation number three, where, where you should have a home. And um, that's one where I remember the debate or discussion when we talked about it uh, last month of uh, whether it stays where it's at or goes to Department of uh, Health and Social Services. To me, that seems to be the natural alignment. Just if you would wake me up first thing in the morning and ask me, I think it just fits better there. Um, so I'll look forward to the discussion on that uh, recommendation three. Again, there seems to be alignment and agreement on all the other recommendations except that one. And um, uh, I'm curious to hear more about it. Thank you. Representative, you're just quickly, cause I just, I must've just missed it. Did you say that you were, that you had a, a, a preference there based on, based on the public comment and the analysis you saw? Yes, uh, I would advocate that they become a part of or under Department of Health and Social Services. Okay, and I'm happy to have that conversation now. And just curious if you know to get us started, some of the aspects that you either heard in the presentation or in public comment that um, why you feel that way. Well, the clientele that they're catering to and servicing um, in regard to individuals in long-term care facilities, nursing homes. To me, the roles and responsibilities, looking at staffing metrics, looking at quality of care, looking at uh, facilities, to me, it just that aligns more of a health issue versus uh, something under, um, you know, the Secretary of State or the, you know, side recommendation to Homeland Security. I, I just don't see the fit there. I get the argument without the conflict of interest, since the state has a couple of facilities that might, that might present a conflict of interest. But at the end of the day, I just still think it aligns better with uh, the Department of Health and Social Services. Thank you. I appreciate you getting us started. Representative Griffith, was it in response to this line of questioning? All right. Yes. So I actually have the same questions. Um, and I and I understand the balance. Like we need to make sure that there's some autonomy by this organization because of the, the nature of the work that they do. And so there are some state facilities and that might become uncomfortable. Um, I do know that the ombudsman is at DHSS, um, and I've heard talk that that might move to another agency. Um, and also, and I, I guess this question's for Mark, and maybe you don't, if you don't know Mark, I, I don't, I'm sorry to ask this question. Hasn't there been some challenges, and maybe I'm mistaken, with other kind of similar commissions or organizations that are under Department of Safety and Homeland Security and that they're there, they're there, but it's not quite, it's a little challenging because it, like what Representative Yurik was saying, the natural causal link there of like the placement, it's, it's true. It seems like very much out of place. Um, and whereas DHSS, and, and again, recognizing, I understand that we have to do, potentially do something to avoid that conflict. 
it avoids that siloing that can happen in government where it you don't have if you're in the same department you have access regularly and routinely with those folks that deal with these issues all the time. And so communication barriers are easier just by virtue of the fact that they're all in the same department. Whereas if you put something over at Homeland Security, it's just, it's, it, it just, it seems like it might cause some, you know, some, some difficulties with communication, et cetera. So number, I guess my question is, what's the advantage of putting it in a, a Department of Safety and Homeland Security other than the avoidance of you know, feeling uncomfortable about critiquing some state nursing homes. Um, and two, have there been issues with other similar commissions or organizations um, that are sort of unnaturally placed uh, at uh, Department of Safety and Homeland Security? Um, thank you. So this option one was kind of a compromise because I, I tend to agree with Representative Yurik, that that given the offices and the divisions involved in this work, the the natural fit is where the statute is, and and that's DHSS. Um, option one, I I was looking for a compromise within the executive branch um, for placement based on some of the comments from the last meeting. So based on the Based on the fact that the DDC, the Delaware Developmental Disability Council, um, was moved there via epilogue language and the bond bill, much like DNHRQAC is housed within the admin offices of the court of the because of the budget bill, I, I kind of drew drew the straightest line I could from that to this um, and. Looking at the Department of State as well, there the line was much more crooked. <laughs> Whereas, um, based on the two councils that are currently housed within the safety aspect of um, safety and homeland security, that's kind of that's the compromise I thought worked best. So I'm sorry for the rambling answer, but I I oh, no, did no, want to no, kind of explain fair. my thought process there. <laughs> That's fair. And just to follow up quickly on that, have the have the departments themselves, like I guess, has the judiciary or administrative office of courts um, issued any um, position on the change, or have either the secretaries of DHSS or uh, uh, Homeland Security? I have reached out uh, to the Department of Safety and Homeland. S Security uh, about a week ago. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Um, DHSS, when I spoke with them, um, just said, we'll work with whatever you give us. Kind of a, not a yes, not a no, but just if, if we get there, we get there kind of answer. Um, with regards to the uh, administrative offices of the courts, um, not directly. I do recall uh, the past few years they've been they've been trying to more or less kind of get away from their section of admin offices to the court, um, trying to find a way to strictly stay within the actual court system and not have as many administrative offices, they, they, they currently have five. Um, so to answer your question, no, I haven't had conversations directly about that, but I, I just know that, that that's kind of been a conversation that's been happening over the years, particularly around budget hearing time. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Griffith, Representative Dorsey Walker, and welcome uh, to our vice chair. And so appreciate you being here, be Mark present, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is pretty similar to Representative Yerrick and Representative Griffith. And where else, if we could potentially hear from Margaret and or Lisa on this, if this department, excuse me, if this entity is not housed in the Department of Safety and Homeland Security and not DHSS, then where else could it potentially go? Ms. Bailey, Ms. Ferber. Hi, thank you. 
Um, actually, a few years back when uh, the judicial branch was discussing the non-judicial agencies and where they felt we were um, better housed, um, we had a, a minor discussion, not, not run by the administrative office of the courts, but us non-judicial agencies spoke. Um, there was another section under the Department of Justice, more or less in like the consumer protection area that would be, we th felt better suited. Therefore, we could have oversight. Um, it would not be a conflict in working with, um, you know, everyone under health and social services that we're looking at the service they're providing too. Um, and we wouldn't be further removed in an area like Homeland Security. Lisa, do you have something you'd like to add? No, actually, I don't have anything to add in relation to um, Representative Dorsey Walker's question because I don't have another suggestion as to where um, we could, the commission could be appropriately housed. Madam Chair, a follow up question for Absolutely. Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Representative. Thank you so much. Ms. Bailey, it sounds like maybe you need a little help from this committee to go where you feel maybe the best suit for your entity. Did I hear you properly? And did I interpret that properly? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we're here to do. Thanks. Can, can I can I just follow yeah. quickly if if Ms. Ferber or Ms. Bailey, do, do you believe that placement in Homeland Security would hinder your operations in any way? Thank you. Um, I feel we'd be a lot further removed. Um, it's taken many years um, from our state realizing that we need more oversight in the facilities and the services that are providing. And especially with us aging, I, I feel as though um, if we went to Homeland Security, we would not have the insight um, as we do right now. Um, we've worked on building a lot of relationships, which we can always work on, but I feel we would be a lot further removed. Can, and can you help me understand more about more what you mean? When, when I think about removed, I think down the hall and we're all very removed from each other right now, right? So we've all made it work. So it sounds like you're talking though about information sharing or accessibility. Can you give me an idea? Is this on your subject matter work? Is this on your um, management of, you know, administrative management of the board work? Like what pieces do you feel that you would lose? Um, well, do you want me to break it down as to yeah, if it was great. DHSS versus Homeland? No, I'm most, I'm most interested in, in Homeland Security and trying I, I, I sense, I don't know, but I sense that the, the conflict of interest or the, the oversight of the, org, of, of, the, of the administrative piece there, I think folks here may be sensitive to your arguments there about moving to DHSS. So I'm really trying to understand whether Homeland Security can be a good fit and I don't want to hurt your opportunity to be successful should we move you cognizant of the administrative office of the courts trying to remove some of these oversight responsibilities that we've seen that trend? Sure. Um, part of me says that moving us to Homeland Security uh, wouldn't be any different than leaving us under the judicial branch. Um, again, if you look at both the courts and Homeland Security, those are two I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, you know, we're already established where we are. Um, although there are some advocacy type groups under Homeland Security currently, um, I just I just feel like that would remove us from um, sharing of information a lot. Um, I'm, I'm real close and on the um, agencies that we're working with with DHSS and having this in Homeland I feel would put us um, back many, many steps on the progression that we've worked on for years. Lisa, do you have something you'd like to add? Just real quick, I'm sorry, Ms. Ferber, but Ms. Bailey, now I'm confused because it sounded like you all didn't wanna be in DHSS, but you're telling me that you have good relationships there. We have great relationships with DHSS. Okay. Our recommendation is to not move to either one of those and to remain where we are under the courts. 
Right. And my question to you is, I heard you say that moving to Homeland Security wouldn't be a drastic difference. You had talked about feeling removed from things. And I'm wondering what aspects of being a budget line under the courts rather than a budget line under Homeland Security, I'm, I wonder, I'm wondering how does that impact your ability to be successful? Because it sounds like you that, that would be a disfavorable move from your point of view. And I want to understand why you feel that way. Okay, as far as housing the commission somewhere other than where it is right now, um, there's also HR factors that we haven't even gotten into in this discussion yet, mm -hmm. moving from one branch of government to the next, um, which I have some concerns about and I addressed um, with ch our chair and um, legislators on the commission. Um, and as a matter of fact, we, we sent a letter, I'm trying to make sure that all the um, Sunset Committee members received um, our follow-up response to these yep. recommendations. Um, I, I, I'm not sure where to go from here. Lisa, do you have some feedback you'd like to provide? Um, sure. I, I think I will just echo that um, the Commission's preference is to remain where we are, but among the, the two options that were presented, um, the commission feels that the Department of Safety and Homeland Security would be a more appropriate option um, because it eliminates the conflict of interest. Um, it gives us an autonomous voice to maybe make comments related to the services that are not complementary. Um, and um, having looked at the um, recommendations, I um, have some interaction with the other um, two agencies that are listed that are currently under um, the Department of Safety and Homeland Security. And um, I know that they um, feel that um, they are autonomous in that placement and that they are able to advocate zealously for the um, communities and um, individuals that they're um, tasked with doing. So um, because of those things, that, that's why I think that we feel like if um, we are going to be moved from the administrative office of the courts, why the Department of Safety and Homeland Security would be our preference. I appreciate you both giving that additional clarity. And I just would ask specifically related to the HR issues. I believe there, the commission has one employee, right? And that is you, Ms. Bailey? Yes. And so um, I, can you just expand on the HR complications that you might foresee with a move? Um, I just think we need to take a look a little closer um, on what the rules are um, under the two branches for uh, judicial and executive branch. I, I believe when um, some of us non-judicial agencies looked um, at the information before, there were um, some compensation, you know, a little bit of difference in compensation, um, meaning, for example, um, like the number of hours that um, of compensation and things like that. I, I want to make sure we're looking at the whole picture. So, um, if I, as an employee of one, is moved to another branch, it isn't going to affect me. Um, no, thank you. I appreciate unintended. That. that clarity is really helpful. Mark, do you have any comments, or, or Amanda, have you had any experience um, in your roles working with with moving folks between departments? I mean, that way, do you have any insight to provide? I would assume that um, departments would work with incoming um, staff, but I don't want to assume if I don't know. I, I, based on my very limited interaction, that's that's been my experience um, as well. I know uh, I would actually defer to uh, Amanda, who has a little more interaction with the state's HR system than than I do. Uh, so I would, if if she has any comments, that would be that would be helpful for me. I am. I am so sorry. I am pulling double duty. I had to give comments at the um, Healthcare Commission's 
uh, meeting. I just got done doing that. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Senator? Sure, thank you. And I appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, it was just, just a quick question and not to put you both on the spot, but I'm wondering in your experience um, in, with working with the state, moving folks between um, agencies or between branches, um, whether it, it's normal for the incoming uh, the, the the incoming staff to kind of work with the agency to ensure that compensation hours job expectations are um, comparable uh, before there's like a, a large change. Yes, uh, I believe so. I mean, my background is I spent three 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 years. I'm sorry, trying to remember my head. I spent three years at the um, Division of Professional Regulation working with boards and commissions. Okay. And then I spent three and a half years um, with the pension office in an HR capacity. So yes, if a board is going to move to a different administrative unit, um, that's going to offer more administrative support. Um, that's also going to provide some more HR support um, because you know that that is part of the process when you're when you're moving something, um, and also I I think we were talking earlier in this meeting just about you know the hiring um, and the oversight of an executive director of a board or commission. Uh, that's also important because you know if we're thinking back to like DIA's meeting. Um, Department of Ed has oversight over that commissioner. So I think it would be a similar relationship here. Amanda, you got to be careful mentioning DIA in a meeting. Where we I know. I, <laughs> I know, but it's fr it was fresh in my mind. I would think it'd be fresh in the committee, other members' minds. But yes, we were talking about that a couple weeks ago in that relationship with, you know, the oversight agency and the, you know, the commissioner and the, the board members and the executive director. No, I appreciate y'all pinch hitting on that. And I know we can always uh, run down more information if needed. Um, I know that Representative Johnson's been waiting so patiently. Thank you so much, Representative. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I've been waiting patiently. So I'm, I'm here. Let me get my notes so I make sure I hit all of the points. One, I will say I have uh, and really enjoyed talking this through. And I think it's extremely important that we continue to talk it through. On, on its face, absolutely, you think this makes sense. It fits so naturally within DHSS, without a doubt. Get that. At the same time, though, I fully understand the concern of conflict of interest. I also understand and I believe that having them under DHSS will definitely limit their autonomy. And, and not only limit their autonomy, um, you know, it's like DHS is the boss, right? And you can't say or do anything against them. So that's going to limit what they're able to do in the event that, you know, they have to review an entity that is run by the state. So they're already limited in, in that way. The other thing that I'd like for you guys to think about, because I'm writing all this down, is as it stands, I think maybe it started in 150, 150th General Assembly, there is a uh, DHSS reorganizational task force. Why? Because there are already some perceived challenges that are occurring within that particular division and the work is still being done. And I wrote down what Mark said. Mark said when, you know, when he spoke with them, they were like, hey, eh, whatever you want us to do. That's not a yes, that's not a no. It's just like, we'll do whatever because essentially they know they have to do whatever. So I would caution us and just really think about the transformation that DHS has undergone since the previous secretary left, and we have a new-ish -er secretary, even though uh, Molly's been a part of the system for quite some time, and knowing that there may be some reorganization that happens within that particular area. The other thing that is extremely important is that 
we want this entity to be successful. And in order for them to be successful, we have to, to, to listen and take into consideration really what they believe is required to be successful. They do some serious work and I, I'm sure we all want to see them be successful. So I am really appreciating the discussion. I hope that we continue um, and figure out how we do this together so that they can be successful wherever they land. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative. Representative Griffith. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I do appreciate this uh, discussion and I have actually landed, I think, on my view of where um, the commission should go. And I am committed and I believe that we do need to move this organization out of the judicial branch. You know, I, there's really no oversight there for um, this organization and every, you know, every organization needs some, some sort of uh, support outside of just administrative support. So I do believe it does need to move out of the judicial branch. And that makes sense. Um, and I, I, I am sensitive to the concerns raised about the, um, you know, the, the potential conflict there. And, and we do want this organization to have, um, you know, some, some power, some ability to really feel free to criticize if necessary um, the work of, of a facility it's reviewing or looking into. Um, that indeed was probably the purpose of Senator Marshall's, um, Senator Marshall's uh, idea when this was years ago. So, um, you know, where it should go, um, it seems that since there are, there are other um, groups that are similar and that are under Department of Safety and Homeland Security, I appreciate Mr. Brainerd's recommendation sort of, um, idea to put it over at Homeland Security. I am, uh, um, no, I'll just leave it there. So that's that's where I'd land on it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Spiegelman, is this on, uh, is your comment on this line of questioning or a new line of questioning, if you don't mind me asking? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm not really sure. It, it kind of is and it kind of isn't. How about that? So it, it might as well just plow ahead at this point. Um, you might as well. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is, uh, and, and I realize that we lost an entire year last year, but I think this is the third or fourth organization that we've had before us this year where collectively a lot of this committee either was not here or does not remember the reasons why in, I guess, 2019 or was it 2018, this organization was originally requested to go before the, the Sunset Committee. Um, and the reason why I'm saying it may have something to do with what we're talking about now is are we, by moving it to the Department of Health or the Department of Homeland Security, are we solving one or the other, are we solving the issue for which the organization was originally sent to the Sunset Review, if, if that question makes sense. I think going forward, what we may want to consider is as part of the follow-up process that we're doing now with organizations is have something in writing back from when the organization was requested to go to a sunset review that reviews why it was requested to go to a sunset review. That's not something that, that we frequently see. Um, it's something that I haven't seen in the sunset committee. And it's just something that struck me that while Krista Griffith was, was while Representative Griffith was talking, she wasn't here for the, for the presentation. And so she wasn't here to know, or, or what, she wasn't here when we even voted to have this organization go through the year before. Um, Nothing against Representative Griffin, she wasn't on the committee. And so I think one of the things that we should do perhaps collectively as a committee is have more of a bit of a look back as to why an organization was sent to review in the first place. Um, because I honestly don't remember. I mean, yeah, I've read the report, but I don't remember the specific reasons why who, whatever representative or senator made the request for this organization made that request, if that makes sense. Yep, 
Thank you, Representative Spiegelman. Um, I will say a couple things. One is that it is routine for members of the committee to review or to review recommendations of organizations that they did not choose. I will also say that um, when a senator or representative may bring up a, a reason for something to be reviewed, that could be a very subjective reason. It could be a personally held reason. It could be a widely held reason. And in many cases, things are not coming before sunset for a reason. The only reason is because we are charged with reviewing all boards, commissions, et cetera. So I think that I'm happy to ask Mark and Amanda and Holly and everyone to give us more information. I think it's helpful to understand the context, but I also what felt very capable based on the reports and recommendations, the letters of support and everything else to make decisions on this. So I don't want uh, folks watching or, or members of this board to think that you know we're calling into question the ability of this committee as constituted today to make decisions about and i know you don't think that's true either i know that you support yeah, I, I, yeah that that that, that was not know. insinuated in 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 my comments in any way of course not but we wouldn't well, want any my confusion point was that, yes so so i appreciate that you brought that up and, and i think that i wanted to focus on recommendation three and make sure that we wrap up on recommendation three so that everyone is heard on that that issue. Um, but I think going forward, Representative Spie Mark, I, I don't know if you need to comment on this or not, but Representative Spiegelman's ask, I think, is reasonable. And I think it's good to have as much information in front of us as possible. So if you're able um, to go back and provide any other notes, even um, that you all took that were helpful to you in forming the recommendations, I'm sure that every committee member who I know reads so many of the things in front of us would be happy for more information. Sure. Just, just to clarify, um, a couple things. The original presentation for this entity was scheduled for the day we all went home in 2020 for the pandemic. Yeah. So the rescheduled presentation meeting that occurred in February of this year was the first, sorry, was the first presentation meeting for this group. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it was put under sunset review um, in 2019, in June of 2019. And I believe there wasn't a lot of discussion as to why that occurred. Um, from what I recall, it was, this is an organization dealing with an issue that is very timely and it's, it's affecting a lot of constituencies that we serve. And it, I got the indication that certain members of the committee and the legislature wasn't sure what this entity did. So that kind of informed the questionnaire, the draft report, and then based on that, in addition to the presentation meeting that happened this year with this committee, um, that's where a lot of these recommendations come from. I hope that clarified and answered the question. Representative Spiegelman, did you have any follow-up for Mark? Yeah, that clarified and answered the question and provided me even more justification for my request. You did all three at the same time. So thank you. Appreciate that. Absolutely. And and that's that's that, it's a perfect segue to say if if you all as JLOSC members have a reason for bringing something to your staff, absolutely, please tell us why. And then that way we can adjust the way we work to make sure that you get the answers that you want. Thank you. Amanda, did you want to add anything? Yes, I just want to kind of reiterate what you said, Senator Gay, is that when this committee picks an entity for review, there really usually isn't a specific reason. It's, you know, the, the traditional uh, sunset and oversight review. So it doesn't need a reason like the entities that were just picked last week. Those are proactive. It's following our proactive format. Whereas in the past, um, it was more reactive, like how Mark had mentioned, but I, I just want to make sure that everyone listening understands that there typically is not a reason for selecting an entity for sunset and oversight review. It's what this committee was set up to do, and, and that's the work that we do here. I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I have to disagree with that. Um, I, I would argue it's probably closer to 50-50, that, that about half the organizations re-review re are very specific reasons as to why there's a specific problem to be addressed, brought forth by a representative and senator. And sometimes Amanda's absolutely correct, but I would not say most of the time. I'd say it's probably 
Representative Speakman, I was about to recognize you, and I would appreciate if you respect my need to manage the flow of this meeting. I was about to recognize you, and I would clarify that what Amanda said is that the analysts today are changing the way they have done things. And so you are absolutely right that this committee has operated differently in the past and that the analysts are moving towards a new model where we try to meet the theoretical goal of this organization. I'm happy to have this conversation at another agenda item, but I wanna focus on the recommendations here today. And I, as I think our analysts said, they are happy to provide you any information that would help you and the rest of the committee make appropriate decisions going forward. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? Okay, sorry, I can't hear you, but I think I heard you say no. Representative Griffith, did you want to comment on recommendation three or start a new um, round of questioning? Uh, no, just uh, briefly on recommendation three and, and to respond to Representative Spielman, I won't belabor the point. I, I didn't just land, I, you know, yes, I was not here for the, when this uh, was initially referred to this uh, committee. However, I did listen intently to the presentation that was done in February. I have reviewed the recommendations and reports uh, submitted by staff, and I have some familiarity um, with this organization outside uh, through my legal experience um, at the Delaware Department of Justice. So just to be clear and for the record, because it did seem that Representative Spiegelman was suggesting that I was just, you know, jumping into a, a conclusion here. Uh, my conclusion for uh, to move to Department of Safety and Homeland Security was supported by uh, everything that I just uh, stated in my review. Thank you. I want to. I hear. I see your hand, Representative Spiegelman. But I want to ask Ms. Ferber had her had her hand up. Ms. Ferber, did you want to provide any commentary on Recommendation Three? If not, then I'll come back to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to offer um, as some additional considerations for the committee that, in addition to just some state-run facilities that the commission provides. Um, review and um, we're looking at quality assurance. We also provide review and sometimes criticism of divisions that fall under the Department of Health and Social Services, such as the Division of Healthcare Quality and um, the Ombudsman's Office. So it's not just the state run facilities that we sometimes are looking at as part of our purview. We're looking at, um, do we feel that um, the division is appropriately responding to the needs and their um, charges? Um, so um, I just wanted to offer that as some additional um, consideration. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. That's very helpful. Representative Spiegelman, on this topic, please one more comment and then perhaps you, me and Representative Griffith can talk offline about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, Representative Griffith, I was not. Thank you. And that is the Delaware way, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that there are folks from other places uh, because we agree to disagree all the time. Um, I would like to ask if there, if anyone could raise their hand with additional commentary around um, recommendation three. Okay. Seeing none, I'd like to open the floor for commentary on additional recommendations. And please, I would ask the committee at this point in time, if you if you have specific changes you'd like to see, um, I appreciate the conversation. I think that this has helped us delve into what we need to do um, to perhaps modify or choose which option. Um, but if you have specific wording you'd like changed or if, if your comments are connected to a specific recommendation, please try and be specific about that because I do feel that we may be in a position to move forward with at least some of the recommendations today. Of course, if I'm wrong about that, we'll have our analysts go back um, and make some changes and, and give us some more information. All right, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to take uh, my liberties now um, to uh, chat uh, about a couple of things. One is um, I, I personally, in, in, in hearing the presentation, and again, Ms. Ferber, Ms. Bailey, appreciate the time you took before to give us your presentation. I heard it and I heard in so many of the letters that we received how core to, to this organization Ms. Bailey is and the work that she does. Um, and I was curious, um, you know, Mark and Amanda, if you had considered as part of moving forward, whether, you know, either memorializing what this job is 
um, understanding what succession planning looks like. Because when we have one person who is so important to an organization moving it forward, I'm wondering how we continue the health of the organization, even you know if Ms. Bailey decided to uh, to leave for some reason, um, or you know I, I don't want to lose that institutional knowledge that has been gained. There, there is, um, you know, history of this committee putting something either in a progress report or the annual report that an entity does something along, including job descriptions of staff, any sort of strategic planning or forward thinking or um, a breakdown of, of staff time utilization. There, there are many different mechanisms that that this committee can use in that sort of reporting system that that you all ask entities to do in order to kind of reach those those kinds of uh, goals and answer those kinds of questions. Okay, so you, so you would believe that would be most properly placed in recommendation nine. Is that correct? Correct. Something. Um, yeah. And, Adding another bullet point. Recommendation that, ten. I'm sorry. Follow up reporting, not annual reporting. Is that correct? Oh, sure. It, either one. If if okay. if you would like, since since the entity's annual report goes to the governor's office, the general assembly, and DHSS, that that could be something that each year uh, could be looked at again and um, revised. If if the director takes on something else, that that could be added to the running job description, or that could be added to the breakdown of, of staff time or the planning process for what happens in the next five years kind of thing. Um, or it, it, it could be part of the follow-up recording this year of developing something now and, and putting it together for this committee for next year. Okay. Um, if it's something as simple as recommendation 10 shall submit a status report, um, including, you know, succession planning or, or, or staff planning or something along those lines. If it's as simple as that, I'd be interested in looking at it. If it's more complicated, I would ask you to um, take a better look at it. Um, but maybe sure. can you work something up while we're sitting here and we can yep. discuss it if we get there? Okay. Is there anything else? Um, that folks would like to discuss today. Representative Yerick, I know you had started our conversation on recommendation three, um, wondering um, if you were interested in um, getting us started with any motions uh, or if you would like to discuss that any further. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll start with the, the first comment that I had when I raised my hand about some of the other recommendations that um, when you mentioned about a, a job description and succession plan, it reminded me of the and I apologize, the, the agency that we reviewed, the Career Technical Agency, they were an army of one as well, that when that one leaves, what happens? And this is the same scenario, deja vu all over again. We have one employee, you win the Powerball, you move on, you retire, what's left? I think it's helpful to have some really uh, highly recommended uh, roles and responsibilities that we could add value to. For example, in my opinion, the Consistency in the rubrics in regard to visiting the facilities is probably, in my opinion, the, the most important aspect of it. It's great that you're a, a conduit to answer specific questions for individuals, and that's very, very important. However, that the consistency in the system and a process to annually review facilities, I think, is extremely important. Uh, maybe not as important the recommendation on you know, the metrics in regard to staffing of the facilities, that's a real challenge to finding qualified people to work in the facilities, but I think it's very important. So I just concur with what you said, Madam Chair, about the, uh, the necessity perhaps in that recommendation 10 to add some additional criteria into a, a job description or what we believe in conjunction with the commission, what are the most important aspects of the role in the commission. So I just wanted to add that. Um, my can, can, I, can I interrupt you real quick, Representative Beard? Just Absolutely. Based on what you said, I didn't think about the idea of, of, of time use and time, you know, and staff utilization and, and potentially I had I had focused in on recommendation 10, but I'm wondering perhaps if it's not just succession plan, it's not just for forward looking, but it's actually a report on on the time and how staff and, and making sure that those visits are a piece of it. Maybe it belongs as as a as an E under recommendation nine as part of the annual reporting. 
what do you feel would you feel comfortable with something along those lines thank you yes okay not just looking for tomorrow but what's happening today right. Right. yes no thank you and apologies for interrupting you oh, i appreciate that thank you um if I may ask, Madam Chair, were you looking for some additional or perhaps a recommendation moving forward in regard to some of the recommendations, perhaps a motion? Never mean to put you on the spot, Representative, I know you're never shy about making motions. So, um, you know, we had reached a point where I didn't see any more hands raised. Um, I feel that we've had a robust conversation that we could at least maybe start to address the recommendations as we go through. Um, and so I would entertain a motion and I do not need me to put you on the spot. Any one of our committee members can entertain or can move, uh, but I want to make sure that um, we had covered recommendation three to the extent that you were comfortable since you raised that issue. I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, and at the point where I would make the recommendation to move forward, recommendation three, where my opinion is to uh, appreciate the, the insight and the debate and the response However, my recommendation is to move it to the Department of Health and Social Services. Um, to me, in the sense of clarity, and if we, we had three simple ways to have a word association, whether it's security with Homeland Security, courts with justice, and health with health, I, I just can't get past that. It, to me, it just aligns the most reasonable under health. And with that, that would be my recommendation that uh, we would make the uh, the move for um, NHRQAC to be under the responsibilities of the Department of Health and Social Services. If you wouldn't mind, Representative, I think we would want to look at continuing the organization first uh, before we decided where it went. Um, and so I'm happy to move to you or to another member um, to talk about recommendation one and the options there. Does anyone have a motion regarding recommendation one? Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Is it possible that we can have the recommendations back up on the screen, please? Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank sorry you, about Mr. that. Hold on one second. I'm trying. I'm I'm okay. editing the document and then trying to save it at the same time. So as soon as I can close you, out, you Representative, I'm told that back in the day before Zoom, they would actually have packets in front of us with all the information. <laughs> Lots of paper. <laughs> I'm just shaking my head, Madam Chair. <laughs> so recommendation number one is to continue or terminate. And as Mark stated in the beginning of this meeting, this is the standard recommendation and the options that are provided by the staff. Um, and so I would be um, curious if um, anyone would be interested in making a motion regarding recommendation one to continue or terminate. I do feel that we've had good discussion about the value of this organization. Um, and so I'm happy. Madam Chair, I move that we continue. We we um, um, follow recommendation one, option one to continue um, the Delaware Nursing Home Residence Quality Assurance Commission. Second. Thank you, Representative Griffith and Representative Dorsey Walker. Um, there's been a motion to to continue um, under option one of recommendation one. Um, and Mark, you can go ahead and leave those up there because I think folks are, are going to be wanting to look through them as we go. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Senator Pinkney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, noting uh, Representative Yerick's motion uh, recommendation to move the committee under Department of Health and Social Services. I know we have some very robust conversation that I appreciate, um, but before we go to that motion, I don't, it, it might have went over my head, but I didn't see how we would overcome the factors of um, conflicts of interest if we were to put this under DHSS. So can we maybe, if, if that is something that we're gonna make a motion about, um, can we can we talk about those factors? Because uh, it, it's been said, and it's absolutely right that there are state agencies, state um, state nursing homes, and and Miss Bailey even now gave us the insight that it's also the ombudsman and so many other programs that they look at that would need to be evaluated and and could present um, present a fear factor for for a less thorough investigation if we were to move this under DHSS. So can we talk about how? those conflicts of interest would be overcome. Um, yeah, and Senator Bingley, if you don't mind, I'd like to table that question while we consider recommendation number one. So we can't move, that's okay. We can't move them or keep them where they are. 
um, until we know whether they're going to continue. So the motion on the table is for recommendation number one, option one, um, to continue this organization. Um, and there's been a motion and a second. And I want to know if there's any conversation or comment specifically on recommendation number one. And then Senator Pinney will come right back to you when we get to number three, if we get there. Thank you. All right, seeing, seeing no um, questions or comments, um, there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion to continue under recommendation one, option one, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Hearing no opposition, the motion is adopted and recommendation one, option one is adopted. I'd like now to move to recommendation number two. This, as Mark stated, is also part of the um, general recommendations that we see every time. Do I have a motion regarding recommendation number two for statutory updates and technical corrections? Motion to approve general statutory updates and technical corrections to the DH, DNHR, I don't have my glasses on, QAC's entire governing statute. I'm sure it's to make sure that this is consistent with our legislative drafting manual and all the technical things that we need to do as part of our um, update. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. Thank you, Representative Griffin and Representative Dorsey Walker. Um, is there any questions or comments about recommendation number two? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to adopt recommendation number two, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, hearing no opposition, recommendation two is adopted. Thank you very much, Mark. And we're moving down to recommendation number three. And then I'd like to recognize Senator Pinckney again um, to, and, and Senator Pinckney, I know your question was about DHSS conflict of interest. Would you like to direct that question to our, our guests from the commission or to our analysts? Um, I, maybe, the, maybe we can start with the analysts if you guys have any insight to, to what that might look like. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mark, did you um, have any comments about the DHSS move or a move? I, I, I understand the, the concern about um, independence and autonomy. What that's, that's kind of why I, I, I stated that we would work with the department and the, the entity to find a fit be, because while you know, there, while I don't necessarily believe that the long-term care uh, ombudsman or the uh, healthcare quality division would, would be the, the best fit given the work that's done, um, because this group is, is an advocacy group in, in nature and doesn't, doesn't possess any legal regulatory authority over the department and those entities, I feel like there could be um, a fit uh, there. Uh, Senator Gay, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bailey or Ms. Ferber, did you have um, any other um, comments? And, and specifically, you know, I, I would like to hear, based on what Senator Pinkney asked and what Mr. Brainerd um, answered, you know, because of the reg because of the way that the regulatory structure or the oversight is set up, what are your specific concerns regarding DHSS? I'm trying to understand what, I know the idea of, of conflict of interest, but can you give me in practice some of the concerns that you believe you face? Um, I'm gonna ask Lisa if she would like to answer first. Ms. Ferber. Thank you, um, sure. I think as part of the commission's regular role, we regularly are reviewing things that the Division of Healthcare Quality is doing, and we may or may not agree that they are um, working as robustly as um, we might like to see them work. Um, I think sometimes we have the same concerns about the Ombudsman's Office. Um, we looked at um, the Division for Services on Aging and Adults with Physical Disabilities. They, um, unless I am mistaken, are, um, have oversight for the Delaware Hospital for the Chronically Ill. 
which is a long-term care facility. So we might frequently have, um, you know, concern or feedback um, regarding that. Um, we may also have some concern or feedback um, related to the division of um, Medicaid and medical assistance. While it seems like that's farther removed, I would agree, but um, many people who are receiving long-term care services are on long-term care Medicaid. And so there may be inefficiencies with that process um, that we might be providing feedback about. Um, so I, I think from my perspective, it would be really hard to identify a place under DHSS that would allow us to have that same level of autonomy and not present a conflict. Um, I don't know, Margaret, do you have other comments or things to, for consideration? I appreciate your, your answer, Lisa. Um, we do have other entities that we look at too, Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. Um, the list goes on and on actually. And that's why we feel that it would be a big conflict under DHSS. Um, there were areas in the past, for example, the Ombudsman's Office was under the Division of Aging, didn't have a lot of voice. And then they were moved onto DHSS cabinet secretary's office. They still don't have a lot of voice. Um, same with uh, adult protective services. So, and and I, I don't want it to be, uh, you know, making recommendations about a sister agency and the internal politeness. We want to be able to make sure the folks that we're working with are protected and are receiving the services that they need. And having... Um, us under DHSS would not be able to help us achieve all of that. I don't believe as freely as we're able to right now. Well, and, and I, I want to understand that because Representative Johnson made perhaps the point of the morning, right, which is we want to make sure that you are set up for success in what you do because you are caring for folks and you are a watchdog, but critically, you are really a watchdog and not a regulatory agency. And so, you know, and, and forgive me, we all bring our own personal perspectives to bear. I work in the courts. I have worked for the, you know, I, I used to work for the courts. I'm an, I'm an attorney now, but I, I had worked for the courts, um, you know, and there were other courts who uh, thought very poorly of some of the decisions that the court I worked for, um, you know, made, but we still worked together as a, um, you know, as the, in the court system, right, to further the goals of that system and further the goals of justice. And we had those disagreements, but there were structures in place in order to manage those disagreements and, their, and, and, and who had authority where. And so because you are not regulating, I'm concerned at where, the, I'm wondering where the conflict is. I mean, budgetary, I mean, moving the budget line item. I mean, I understand that, you know, someone could move to gut your budget, but again, the budget is really, you and your salary, Ms. Bailey. So I'm really trying to understand where the conflict comes in. If it's awkwardness in, you know, reporting what I understand to be the facts about the industry, right? That's, that's not, I don't think, a conflict of, of interest. But if it arises above that, that's what I'd like to hear from, from you all. Lisa, would you like to start? Um, I apologize. I need a, another minute to digest that. That's um, fine. How about we go to Representative Dorsey Walker and then we can come back and feel free to comment. Just let me know when you're ready. Thank you. No, of course. Representative Thank you, Dorsey Madam Walker. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think I can kind of help with the question that you just asked. I just from listening to our presenters on the situation. I think they're trying to, and it sounds like, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it sounds like they're trying to avoid any conflict of interest that could arise if there's a situation where they're having an issue with the overarching body of DHSS and they're under the umbrella of DHSS, then their voices may be silent because they may feel like 
when they bring something to the attention of the overarching body, that it could potentially fall on deaf ears. Now, this is not a knock against DHSS. I'm not saying that by any means. But what I am saying is that if, in fact, they're underneath an umbrella and they have an issue that's brought to their attention and they want to float it up, they I don't want them in a situation. I think what they're trying to do is be forward thinking. And either one of you can interject and say, yes, no, that's not our thought process. But just based off some of what they said and what they didn't say, that's the interpretation that I have. So they're trying to avoid a conflict that could exist because right now, and as we go forward, we'll have some entities that come before us that are a little concerned and don't necessarily want to say what's really happening because people don't want to lose their jobs. So I hope that was helpful, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that perspective. Um, I guess as a follow-up to that, I would, I'm curious from our, our guests, if that reporting up piece, how much do you rely on the courts at this point to kind of report up or where, where, where are you, to me, it felt like you were reporting out to the public, but can you tell me more about your administrative roles and, and how, um, and, and how having, you know, an, an administrator above you in the sense of DHSS or somewhere in that field would be detrimental. That would be helpful for me to understand. Lisa. So um, I think um, that the uh, response that Representative Dorsey Walker shared is some of what my thinking is. Um, some of what the, I can give an example, some of what the commission is undertaking at this point in time, which should um, be on most people's mind is the pandemic and the state's response to um, COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. And um, speaking for the commission, but not specifically because we're not totally there yet, we will be offering um, a number of recommendations and a series of um, things for the state to consider primarily DHSS about their response and how it could be improved. Um, as you may know, and I don't wanna go off too far, but um, you know, there's been a very high death rate um, of individuals in long-term care settings. And um, there are some opportunities for um, improvement and some opportunities to look at what was done very well. And um, I am not certain that the um, Department of Health and Social Services would agree with all of our feedback. Um, and I think that uh, should we be moved under the Department of Health and Social Services, it will be hard to have a open dialogue with them when we're being openly critical. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate the, the You're dialogue. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Um, I know that we're discussing recommendation three. I don't see any hands. I know there was an interest in a motion, but I don't want to cut. I know we can always have additional conversation after. Um, Representative Pinkney, did you feel that um, your question was answered or were there any follow ups? I, I think it was answered. Okay, thank you. I know this is this is a tough one. Um, are there any motions regarding recommendation number three? And recall um, that a member of this committee can also um, ask if more if they need more information. So I don't want anyone to think that um, the only option right now is to adopt the recommendation. This is our first read of these recommendations. We can also ask for more information. But I think it considering our conversation, a recommendation or a motion would be warranted if someone's willing to make it. Um, Madam Chair, I'm prepared to make a motion. I just want to make sure that Representative Yurik had, because our motions are, are slightly different. Um, they're very yes. different. I'm, uh, I would make the motion for option one. I just, for, um, just for um, 
I'd love to get Representative Yerrick the first opportunity since he brought this yeah, up. Yeah, I thought he did. So that's why, you know, and then and, and based on whatever happens with that, then I can whatever make my motion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and appreciate the ongoing uh, discussion about it as well. And, and uh, the director and the uh, uh, the commission chair brings valid points to it. And sometimes it's sensitive and uh, discretion in what we can say in regard to situations. And I appreciate uh, your input. Uh, I don't like kicking cans down the road. Um, I did, I was on the verge of making the recommendation. Listening to the comments, uh, I appreciate the conflict of interest issues and whether DHSS is really supportive of it or not. Um, I still would move forward. My recommendation is that uh, I would suggest, my recommendation is we move them under health and social services. Is there a second for the motion to adopt recommendation number three, option two? I will second the motion so that we can move forward with a vote and we'll see where it goes from there. All right, I'm gonna go do a roll call since there seems to be, um, that it might not be unanimous in this case. Um, so if Mark, could you um, record the votes please? Is there any more discussion on recommendation three before we move forward with the motion? And the motion on the table is to adopt recommendation number three, option two to move to Department of Health and Social Services. Representative Griffith. No. Representative Hansen. I'm sorry, Senator Hansen, there I go again. No. Representative Johnson. No. Representative Yerrick. Yes. Representative Spiegelman. No. Senator Pinkney. No. Representative Dorsey Walker. No. Okay, and I vote no, which means that we, there are not sufficient um, votes to move forward with the motion. If another legislator is prepared to make a motion regarding recommendation number three, I'm happy and remember recommendation number three can be to adopt the recommendation with an option or to not recommend not adopt the recommendation. Madam Chair, I renew my earlier motion to adopt recommendation three option one. Um, legislation specifying that the administrative and budgetary responsibilities related to DNH are QAC are the responsibility of the Department of Safety and Homeland Security. Okay, the motion on the table is for recommendation number three, option to adopt recommendation number three, option one. Is there a second to that motion? Y'all gonna make me second, Thelian? <laughs> Good. Second Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw Senator Pinkney. Was that right or was it represent? Okay, we got a second. Thank you. Representative Year for a comment before the vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just thinking of this recommendation versus what the director and the and the board brought back is their recommendation to keep them where they're at. So I, I just I'm adding that into the discussion as we consider voting on this option that there still remains the current of doing nothing option and keeping them where they're at. So just I'd like to share that uh, with my committee members. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there any other comments um, before we do go to the vote? All right. Question, oh. Madam Chair, I'm sorry, because I'm, I'm looking here and my eyes are kind of old. So uh, to uh, Representative uh, Yurik's comment, I don't see that recommendation here, but that is an option, correct? It is an option, Representative Johnson, to not adopt recommendation number three. And by not adopting recommendation number three, there would be no action on the location of this entity. The motion on the table is to adopt recommendation number three, option one to move. And I, I would note too that um, in the commission's responses, they did say that this would be preferable should there be a move. Um, and I think we've heard um, 
from them today as well, that they are happy where they are, um, but that this would be preferable should there be a move to Representative Yerrick's comments. Um, Representative Griffith. Hi, if we could possibly hear from um, analyst Mark Brainerd as to why um, remaining in, as part of the judicial branch was not included as a recommendation. I'm sure there was a reason why um, th there is some analyst uh, and analysis as to why that would not be appropriate. So if we could hear um, as part of this discussion on the motion um, from Mr. Brainerd regarding why that is not a recommendation. Mr. Brainerd. I didn't include it as a recommendation because my thought what my my recommendation would be to move them out of the judiciary only um, only because of where their governing statute rely, um, is is in code um, as well as looking at the other four uh, offices of the courts you have uh, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself I don't like to talk too much. The Child Death Review Commission um, has the chief judge of family court as an a, a appointed member. The Office of the Child Advocate coordinates programming related to the legal representation for children, including CASA, which is the court appointed special advocate. Um, and the public guardian uh, is charged with providing guardianship services, um, particularly when determined by the Court of Chancery. So they all have a direct line to the court system, whereas this commission doesn't. So that is where my recommendation came from to put them in the branch of government in which they statutorily reside. Thank you. So so in essence, this, this commission is an outlier in that unlike the other three that are under the judicial branch, there's no direct connection so that there will be no direct administrative oversight, if you will, um, with this. So it lacks it, while it has a, a board, uh, the commission, while it has a commission and in that structure, there's no other independent process tied into um, a branch of, of, uh, of oversight. Correct. Statutorily, there's, there's no line there. Right. And would you believe that that would be an important way to make sure that a commission or an agency is operating um, with efficacy and efficiency is to have that additional level of oversight in your experience? Has that been helpful? Yes, I also think it's it's good, for lack of a better phrase, good government, where you look at the Delaware Code and the Delaware law, and you have an advisory board that is tasked with um, advocacy for a population of citizens, and you know they 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 operate within that branch of of government. That's that's where they are obligated to operate from. Thank you. We're tasked with operating. Thank you, Representative. Any additional questions? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Um, if not, then because there may not be anonymity, um, as we stated before, um, the motion on the table is to adopt recommendation number three, option one for the move to Homeland Security. I'll go ahead and take a roll call. Representative Griffith. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Representative Johnson. Yes. Representative Yerrick. No. Representative Spiegelman. Yes. Senator Pinckney. Yes. Representative Dorsey Walker. Yes. And I, as a chair, am voting yes. By my count, that's seven votes in favor, which is enough to adopt the recommendation. Mr. Brainerd, can you confirm? Yes, I have uh, my roll call seven yes, one no. Thank you very much. I know there was some confusion with the, with the counts in our last meeting and to state for anyone watching, um, our recommendation, our, our um, in order to adopt a recommendation, uh, our um, committee needs seven votes. Those are the rules of our committee. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to continue to move along if it works for folks. Recommendation four is related to the name change. I will note that um, the 
commission did come back and say that they weren't a fan of the example. The recommendation does not uh, mandate a change, nor does it mandate the, the change to the example. This recommendation simply would ask the organization to explore name changes in order to improve some of the metrics um, and the, um, for recall that um, Mark explained earlier. Did anyone have a motion related to the name change? And we can have discussion after the motion. Make a motion that we uh, accept recommendation number four and advocate for a name change. Second. Thank you, Representative Yerrick and Representative Dorsey Walker. Are there any comments or questions related to recommendation number four? All right, hearing or seeing none, seeing no hands raised, um, I'm, we'll try it uh, the easy way first and see. Um, all those in favor of adopting recommendation number four, please signify by your silence. All those op opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, hearing no opposition, recommendation four is adopted. Recommendation five related to criteria for facility visits that the commission shall develop a criteria and rubric for visits to long-term facilities. I know this was the subject of some of our conversation this morning. Um, if there's a motion regarding recommendation number five, we could pursue discussion after the motion. I'd like to make a motion that we accept recommendation number five regarding criteria for facility visits. Second. Thank you, Representative Johnson, Representative Dorsey Walker. Are there any comments, questions regarding recommendation number five? Seeing none, I'd ask all in favor of adopting, all in favor of the motion to adopt recommendation number five, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Seeing no opposition, recommendation five is adopted. Thank you very much. Recommendation six is regarding the Eagles law update. Um, and this is asking the commission to engage necessary stakeholders to report and recommend to the Department of Health and Social Services and to the General Assembly the needed changes to Eagles law. The deadline would be no later than January 31st of 2022. Madam Chair, our motion that we accept recommendation six as written, excuse me, adopt recommendation six as written. Thank you, Representative. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Representative Yerrick. For comments and questions, I'll first go to members of the committee. I would simply ask um, our guests today um, whether the January 31st, 2022 uh, deadline is reasonable. I know that the report stated so, but if there are any additional comments, I would like to just to know about that date. Ms. Bailey, Ms. Ferber, do you have any concerns with that date, that deadline? Um, the date might be a challenge, but I, I would like to be able to add the fact that um, in the past, the reports were done by an outside firm. Um, I have no idea how much it cost. Um, and uh, as an office of one, um, I, I feel that we'd need some, some assistance with this, other than just blanketly stating that some recommendations will be made. Thank you for that insight. Mr. Brainerd? This, the intent behind this recommendation is, is not to task the DNHR QAC with completely rewriting the law. That, I, that's, that is not what this is meant to do. It is, it is simply to take um, the commentary that DNHR QAC has, has made um, throughout this process and just kind of let stakeholders know their, their thoughts on it. Our, it, it can be as simple as we recommend that DHSS explore changes to the law, period. We, we, we have through our work, through our facility visits, we've noticed that, you know, certain, uh, certain facilities are out of compliance and we would like DHSS to explore changes to it. Just, it, it's, it, it's not mandating any sort of drafting, legal drafting. Um, it's, it's just about um, 
kind of expanding on the work that they're already doing with in relation to the current statute. Thank you, Mark, for the clarification. And Ms. Berber? Thank you. Um, I just thank you, um, Mr. Brainerd, for the um, clarification. One of the concerns when we're, we're certainly, um, the commission is um, happy to uh, make this um, recommendation. The concern was that the recommendation was going to require the commission to be doing analyzing of um, you know, statistics and so forth. And I am certainly not a mathematician or um, a statistical expert. And so while I feel that the commission and um, Ms. Bailey as our executive director can make more generalized um, recommendations, if we were going to be tasked with making very specific recommendations that would require a higher level of detail and analysis, um, I, I do believe, or I would um, second um, Margaret's um, comments in regard to having some additional resources available to do that type or that level of um, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you um, all, both for your comments and, and thank you, Mark, for your explanation. Um, I think it's important to look at recommendation six in conjunction with the um, recommendations lower down that we'll reach, including annual reporting um, and status reporting that um, these recommendations, if adopted in total, would ask the commission to engage in. Um, and so, you know, we even at the General Assembly have our own specialties. Um, I don't, uh, I don't often draft every piece of legislation that I am, you know, I, I'm, I'm involved in the process. And so I don't think we're asking you all to do anything that's outside of your skill set or your scope. Should the need arise for additional resources to meet what you feel um, is being true to the recommendation, um, there's always an opportunity to engage with us and to engage um, with stakeholders where you are to understand where the resources can be found. But um, I don't read this to involve a statistical analysis. Um, and so, you know, I believe it's I believe it's broad enough to allow you as the folks who are in this field and doing this advocacy work and doing this oversight work to determine um, how you want to move forward. And, and I think in key to this, this suite of recommendations is that we want to empower you to be advocates, not only personal advocates, but legislative advocates. And um, I won't speak for the committee, but I view this as a necessary first step um, in, in expanding um, the role there. Um, so I, I, I hear your concern. I think that with the, the, the reporting built in, I think there's ample opportunity um, for further discussions on this topic should the need arise. Um, so, um, if there's no other comments or questions, we'll try it the easy way. <laughs> uh, for recommendation number six, the motion on the table is to adopt. There was a second. All those in favor, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Recommendation six is adopted by the committee. Recommendation seven, staffing ratios at assisted living facilities. Just considering the statistical conversation we just had, let's see if we can have a little bit of comment um, prior to a motion here. Are there any questions or comments from the committee first relating to staffing ratios, um, the staffing ratios report recommendations, and of course the deadline, January 30th, 2022. I'll go to Representative Griffith first. Hi, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I do really um, appreciate this recommendation because it, it kind of goes to my um, recommend, the recommendation eight issue that I brought up earlier, which is having a pointed conversation on, a, on an issue. And this is an issue that has been raised by my constituents who work in this field, the deep concern, I think, in the community about the staffing ratios um, in assisted living facilities and memory care units. So I think this is one of those examples where um, this commission really can do some great work on issue focus um, with and, and these statistics and um, information about this is easily available. I believe DHSS has studied this. So to have their independent voice on this would be very helpful. And um, to the extent that um, this commission would like, you know, to develop 
an elder caucus around this and not just elder because it's not just elderly who would benefit um, assisted living facilities also uh, work with very young people who may have had um, physical or disabilities or ID um, issues. So um, I would suggest that um, this is, a, I, I really, really like this recommendation. Again, it's a very significant issue that's ha happening in uh, these long-term care facilities. And um, I, I, I'd hope that we'd all adopt it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Um, I'd ask um, Ms. Bailey, Ms. Ferber, um, understanding, just wanting to know if you have access today to the information that you would need in order to draft these recommendations um, or um, any of your comments regarding the suggested deadline. I know that you were in agreement when you submitted your comments, but just curious as to um, those pieces. Sure, um, thank you. I can tell you that the assisted living um, staffing ratios have been looked at before um, a little bit through DHSS. Um, I know there's been a lot of pushback from the industry. Um, and we do agree that the staffing ratios in assisted living need to be revisited as folks coming into assisted living are those that um, had the needs of folks that are in skilled at this time. Um, you know, we can give some generalized um, recommendations and we have been reaching out to DHSS um, for, you know, during the entire pandemic asking to revisit the staffing ratios. Um, we, we haven't gotten anywhere yet, but um, we're gonna continue to pursue it. So if you're looking for generalized answers um, on the need to have um, staffing ratios looked at for assisted living, we'd be happy to give our, our blanket statement. Representative Griffith. This question is from uh, Ms. Bailey, if, with permission, um, Madam Chair. Yes, so please. Here's an issue that's, that's concerning to the commission. Correct. I hear you that, that that you're concerned about this. Has the commission ever taken a vote or uh, made a made you know on, on this issue or any other issue to say this is important? We want the state to address this, and these are our recommendations. Has that ever happened in the um, in the work of the commission? We we have written to cabinet secretary at the time um, on various issues. Yes, um, as far as the staffing ratios and assisted living in particular, um, no, we have reached out to the Division of Healthcare Quality about that on a few occasions. Um, they have some staffing challenges right now and they're trying to prioritize the work. So um, that's the response we got back. Um, we hope to address and work with them once they um, are, um, they have a full organization. Um, but we don't want to wait either. So we know there's a need to have staffing ratios in assisted living. Um, and so that's why we would like to move forward with stakeholders to be able to come up with the best way to do that. Lisa, do you want to add something? Ms. Barber? Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add that um, as part of the usual um, agenda that we have, um, we hear from the Division of Healthcare Quality. Um, they provide reports to us on the staffing ratios. And during the pandemic, um, that has been suspended because they have not been um, doing the annual inspection surveys. They've been doing focused infection control and immediate jeopardy surveys. So the commission has not received from the Department of Healthcare Quality in roughly the last year any statistical information regarding the staffing ratios. So um, I think I would want to hear from the Division of Healthcare Quality because we rely on them to provide us that information. Um, but yes, we feel like it's very important to move forward with these um, staffing ratios so that individuals are receiving quality care and the amount of care that they truly need to be safe and free from abuse and neglect. And if I could just add for a moment, our yeah. next meeting in May, um, we've invited the current cabinet secretary, Deputy uh, Sarah Davis Noonan, and a bunch of leadership um, 
groups to be able to discuss a variety of topics, and that includes the um, staffing ratios. Okay, and I just, I wanna be clear, do you feel that you are well positioned to make a recommendation for staffing ratios by January 31st, 2022? Lisa? Ms. Berber? Thank you. I think um, is that we can certainly make some generalized recommendations. And if we um, have a need to make more um, detailed or focused recommendations, we can certainly ask. So yes, I think we can meet that deadline. Thank you, I appreciate that. Is there a motion regarding recommendation seven? Madam Chair, a motion that we adopt recommendation seven as it is written. Second. Thank you, Representative Dorsey Walker, Representative Griffith. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor of adopting recommendation seven as written, please signify by your silence. If you oppose, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Hearing no opposition, recommendation seven is adopted. Thank you. Um, I note that we are very close to the end of our designated time together and I, and um, I don't, being down to committee members already, um, don't want to lose too many more. So um, I would ask if we could, I know there was some conversation around recommendation eight, if we could move to um, recommendation nine and 10, and then perhaps revisit recommendation eight for um, a larger discussion um, after our um, analysts um, take a look at recommendation eight. Is there any concern with that procedure? Okay, thank you. Um, recommendation nine um, is somewhat standard and it looks like um, we have an additional sub E here that was a, re a result of our conversation today. So I'll read that out. Recommendation nine, annual report updates. Mission shall add the following information to its annual report in addition to A through D, which were previously shared. E would include a breakdown of executive director duties, including percentage of time devoted to each duty. Are there any questions or concerns related to recommendation nine and the addition there? Mark. I just wanted to mention, um, I did, based on the conversation, add um, a, a part, uh, a little clause into B um, that you. any recommendations, including all correspondence made to DHSS, the governor, General Assembly, and other stakeholders be included in the annual report. So those two changes um, have been made during this meeting. So um, if there are any, <laughs> there are any typos, I apologize. No, that's fine. Thank you for pointing that out. I assume that's in response to Representative Griffith's questioning. I appreciate you all being responsive to the dialogue this morning. Um, is there a motion regarding recommendation nine as written? Madam Chair, I motion that we adopt recommendation nine as it is written. Second, Stephanie Hansen. Thank you, Representative Dorsey Walker and Senator Hansen. Any further questions or comments? All right, all those in favor of adopting recommendation number nine as written, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, hearing no opposition, recommendation nine is adopted. Recommendation 10 regards it, uh, is for follow-up reporting. I believe it's fairly straightforward, except as you see, there was an addition added can you highlight the addition mark regarding succession planning and the role of executive director? Thank you. Is there a motion regarding recommendation 10? Madam Chair, I motion that we adopt recommendation 10 as written. Thank you. I saw Representative Johnson say second. I didn't hear you, but I saw it. So thank you, Representative Dorsey Walker. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Um, are there any questions, comments regarding recommendation 10 as written, as displayed on the screen? Okay, hearing none, the motion is to adopt recommendation 10 as written. All those in favor, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. 
Are there any abstentions? Okay, hearing no opposition, recommendation 10 um, is adopted. Um, so I would like to see if we can bump back to recommendation eight, please, since I'm going to use every three minutes that I have and maybe I might take a couple more. Um, regarding the elder caucus, I know there was concern raised about starting something new. Um, I would entertain a motion. Um, again, we can adopt and we can not, we don't have to adopt a recommendation. We can also um, adopt a modified recommendation. We can also ask our staff to provide us with an additional option or retool a recommendation should we want to see something different here. Um, and so I'd like to hear from the committee, but actually first, I'd like to ask Mark and Amanda as just a point of procedure, would you want us to hold off on recommendation 11 until we resolve any um, questions about recommendation eight? Yes, please, that'll be cleaner for us. Thank Excellent, you. thank you. So we'll just complete today by any comments about recommendation eight um, and see where we get in a few minutes. Representative Griffith. Hi, uh, my personal view is that we don't need recommendation eight. Um, you know, if, if it happens, that's great. Um, but I, I just don't see it as a particularly helpful. Um, and if we do adopt recommendation eight, I'd ask that it not be called elder caucus. Um, you know, again, this is pursuing what the function of it would be. It's not mandating that we create a caucus. We as legislators are, are always have that opportunity to create a caucus that's already within our purview. So I don't even think we need the recommendation. I think it's unnecessary. Um, but if we are going to pursue recommendation at eight, I'd ask that it not be called elder caucus because this um, organization and commission deals with a lot of uh, individuals who are not necessarily senior citizens, but more, um, I, I think, more aptly named vulnerable adults. So that my recommendation is to not pursue this recommendation. And if we do to, to um, include uh, the term vulnerable adult. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Griffith. I, I will say I tend to agree that um, it's an additional layer that may not be needed in this circumstance. And I do believe that um, because of the changes to the annual report that were adopted with recommendation number nine, um, sub D will provide um, the General Assembly and others an opportunity to see the progress on the legislative and policy um, um, activities of this organization. And I believe that is the core of what this report and review and recommendations is really trying um, to provide for the citizens of Delaware with respect to this organization, or I should say one of the things we're trying to provide. Um, do you have a, a motion, Representative Griffith? I don't know, would it be proper to make a motion to not adopt a recommendation? I think we- Motion to table. Okay, you, thank you. You can make a motion to table and then that, that's done. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. Um, thank you, motion to table recommendation eight. Thank you, Mr. Brainerd for the suggested uh, language. Thank you, Mr. Brainerd, I agree. Is there a second to Representative Griffith's motion? Second. Thank you, Representative Yerrick. I will try it the easy way, but uh, please, um, we can always go to a roll call if it's necessary. Um, the, the motion is to table recommendation number eight regarding an elder caucus. Any comments or questions? All those in favor, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, hearing none, recommendation eight is tabled. Thank you very much um, everyone for your conversation on that. And we'll move quickly, uh, being aware of the time to recommendation 11 um, regarding release from review or holdover. Um, there are two options here. Um, it, we can do option one, release from review upon enactment of our sponsored legislation and submission of a status report, um, or we can hold this organization over um, to the committee in January, 2022. Members of the committee, are there any comments, questions, concerns regarding recommendation 11, or is there a motion that we can entertain? I move that we adopt option, uh, recommendation 11, option one. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Representative Griffith. Thank you, Representative Yerrick. Uh, Mr. Brainerd, I saw you raise your hand. Was there a comment there? I did just want to clarify for the committee that that should, after 
receipt of the status report, you want a meeting to, to you know, an, an in-person meeting to, to go over any sort of questions, concerns you have, you're perfectly within your authority to do so. Thank you, I appreciate the clarification. So the motion on the table is to adopt recommendation 11, option one, correct, Representative Griffith? Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you, option one. Um, are there any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of adopting recommendation 11, option one, please signify by your silence. All those opposed, please unmute and say nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay. Hearing no opposition, recommendation 11 is adopted. Um, I wanna thank everyone um, for their time today. I wanna thank Ms. Ferber, Ms. Bailey for your time and the work you do on behalf of Delawareans, especially those who are in care. I wanna just echo what Representative Spiegelman said. It was incredibly fortuitous that before the pandemic, this committee uh, sought to review this organization and start to bring to the forefront these issues that we now know are affecting so many Delawareans. And so we know your work is cut out for you. I um, wanna just reiterate what I heard from the committee today is that this process and these recommendations are meant to empower you to do your best work. Um, and if at any point you need to speak with us, speak with uh, Vice Chair Dorsey Walker and me about this process, please always don't, please always reach out. Um, don't hesitate to speak with us. Um, I will just move back to um, our agenda, which thankfully we have reached the end because we are out of our allotted time. Um, I want to note that each of our committee members should have received um, a scheduling poll for our next round of meetings, and that we would request that by Monday, April 5th at 5 p.m., if you could um, look at that as a deadline for, um, for sharing your availability. If there's no other questions or concerns, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all, and if the committee members can please just stay on for, um, for 30 seconds, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, great work.